the financial issues in children's services still remain a priority and within that service the retention and recruitment of social workers is still the most pressing area with any extra recruits seemingly making little difference because of the number of existing workers still leaving the organisation. Um, we've been told many times that NCC uh, spends more per head um, on children's than other councils, although recently this has apparently changed and we're now the second most expensive council and I did wonder if members could be given an up-to-date table um, showing these latest pressures please. And on a slightly different note, the government announced last week a reduction in the council tax referendum threshold, um, but also an additional social care precept, meaning the proposed 3% rise for our taxpayers next year is now likely, I guess, to be 4%. Um, so my question is, how much extra income is that likely to bring in for this council, please? And do we yet have any idea of the value of any additional uh, centrally allocated social care funding for Thank you. 2021? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Haykel. Um, thank you, Leader. Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak. Uh, I just want to reiterate exactly what Councillor Scrimshaw has said. Um, in the past, and you, Leader, were there in, in that same position over the previous years, overspends in children's services was year on year on year, and it accumulated, obviously. Nothing seems to have changed there. And I'm particularly disappointed when you look at 3.5, because the other thing that was slated against previous administrations was not delivering budgets and plans. 3.5, switchage and agency staff conversion, parcel non-delivery of reorganisation, parcel non-delivery of recruitment. It really is time not to be considering what the problem is, but solving it in that way. I just wanted to ask you if there was one thing, Leader, just for you to ponder on, one thing that scrutiny has massively changed in terms of the way in which the Cabinet has made a decision. Just one item uh, that, that comes to mind. Um, leader, all of us uh, gratefully received our Scouting for Democracy badges last year. And our Scouting for Democracy badges were because we had an enormous <coughs> debate about £56,000, tiny amount of money, in this council's budget. Just like this council, Scouting in Northamptonshire is looking at its budget next year. The relief or the relinquishing of that um, cut was only until the end of March this financial year. What I would like to say is, I can't find it anywhere in here, but could you as a cabinet just simply say to Scouting Northamptonshire, we will continue with that until the end of our time, given we didn't think it was the end of our time, so that all those people, something like 2,500 volunteers and 6,000... So, Councillor Haykel... You're, um, you're anticipating, potentially anticipating yep. something that may well not be in the budget. Yep. Uh, this time we can't comment on what may or may not be in the budget. So I think you're going off on a... Can I use the second you just used up to continue? Very quickly. Well, no, I've got 50... Well, not on, not on the scouting issue, on something else, a relevant question to us, please. No, I think that this is the budget and this is the time to bring it up. Right, thank you. On the webcast, people will see in scouting your exact response to that. What is the headroom trigger for paying staff salaries? We talked that there had to be headroom. What is the trigger? On page 18 for libraries, um, it says that we're not going to make £66,000 savings there. Can I be assured that all libraries will be maintained up to a proper standard until the point of handover? Um, on page 27, um, 614,000 in 5.42, under performance on PFI. If <coughs> PFI is underperforming, those schools are losing some service that we contracted for. Are we backfilling those services that are being lost in those particular areas? Right, thank you. That's your page three minutes. Page 43, library self-service. That's your three there. minutes, Councillor Haykel. Can thank we you. make sure that the library machinery will continue after October and not be a deficit Thank you. to libraries. And I've just used up... Right, no, look, for God's sake. Right, so I, we've been talking about the format of Cabinet, and I think we're definitely going to have to change this. If you do not respect the will and control of the chair on this meeting, then we've got to change something and do something about it. So when I say your time is up, the time is up. Thank you. Please respect that.
Right. Okay. Councillor Morris, you were going to add to... Yes, comments. thank you, Chair. I was going to actually uh, speak about something to do with this paper, which seems an unusual occurrence uh, occasionally <laughs> in this room. But I'm going to talk about adult social care and period four, because this is what we're here to talk about, and just point out uh, all the information you require on the, the adult social care services on page 23 to 25... Uh, 26, halfway down 26, but we are showing uh, an underspend of 324k, which is a favourable movement of 819k from the position reported in quarter one. Uh, we are doing our bit in the uh, adult social service uh, to uh, control budgets and make sure that we control any overspends within our budgets. It's very important to note that and to note the hard work of our uh, director as well and her whole team in making sure that this stays on budget. Uh, I think a lot of this is now uh, about how we control care and manage and keep care within budgeted growth and things like that So and demand so that we can uh, do a better job of uh, forecasting what we will spend and won't spend. But it is a very good read um, and I think uh, I would recommend that every department follows the same lead. But I would say that, of course, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Smithers. Yep, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Again, uh, talking about the 1.4 million worth of savings in P4 there, uh, place is predicting an underspend of 1.4 million and it's a movement in the right direction, uh, to be honest, um, of 832k from the reported position in quarter one. Now, I won't labour too much over the details, but it's made up from various areas within the directorate and, of course, the details are in the paper if you so wish to go over those tonight if you're having trouble sleeping. What I will say, though, is it goes to show how efficiencies can be made and if the determination is there to think outside the box and if we all challenge each other to come up with well-thought-out proposals, it's clear that we can supply a first-class service while keeping a control on the costs. Again, you know, I'd like to thank Theresa Grant and the directors and the staff of the portfolio that have worked exceptionally hard to deliver this and uh, deliver to the overall corporate objective. Thank you. Councillor Baker, did you want to make some comments? reference some of the I think, points made by Councillor Scrimshaw. Yes, I can make some comments. I think, Councillor Scrimshaw, if you want in-depth answers to all your questions, if you could send me an email with them all on, I'd be happy to <coughs> get further information for you. But um, the details of the children's element of this paper are on page 20 to 22, which I'm sure you've all read. Um, and we are about to launch a recruitment campaign again for social workers under a completely new format. And we actually <coughs> could do with your support in this campaign. We could do with your support to tell people that actually it is good to come and work and help the children in Northamptonshire, instead of actually always saying that everything about Northamptonshire is not good. So your help could be used in this way, and it would be beneficial to our county and to all of our children, most importantly. We're also relaunching um, the agency conversion from agency to permanent staff in October. Um, placement costs are being reviewed through commissioning arrangements. Caseloads are variable, but we're trying to maintain industry average across the whole of the service. Um, any other questions that you would like interest, uh, in more detail, please do contact me. I'm happy for anybody to do that at any time. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Bowen. <coughs> Um, I just wanted to comment on um, an article that uh, has come out in the papers uh, about the transformation savings. Um, and um, I just wanted to clarify something that perhaps um, wouldn't be understood by everybody. Um, we have um, nearly £42 million pounds of annual savings to make uh, this year. And I think the, the point that I feel didn't come out probably uh, sufficiently was the fact that in so far in period four we've actually achieved 29 million pounds of those savings that's 98 percent and, and I would like to thank Paul Helsby the man behind the transformation because that is a most amazing job now what this article did say was that, that we are only 80 percent on target to achieve those savings in the full year um, that is a conservative estimate and I'd rather he be conservative rather than overly ambitious at this stage in the game, but um, we have every hope that we will achieve those transformation <coughs> savings. As far as the libraries are concerned, um, uh, Councillor Hakewell, uh, we deal with the library queries on a case-by-case -case basis. 
every library is dealt with on its own merits and they are all at different stages in the programme. So as far as your library is concerned, Councillor Hakewell, um, you can obviously liaise with ourselves in particular and lovely to answer that question. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Byrne. I just want to echo some of those points, is that we've got to uh, bear in mind the quantum of um, the ask this year, and we knew how difficult that was going to be. And we've got to remind ourselves of the work that's been done, not only or that's, that's happening this year, but last year, and consider the wider context that we're operating in. It's immensely challenging. We've made a very direct... Um, command, request, whatever you, whichever way you want to frame it, um, to the chief exec to do something about um, the position we find ourselves in. We understand um, the context of um, uh, the ask on children's services and the way the, um, the rest of the organisation has been pointed out by um, various cabinet members today, uh, are leaning in and trying to do their bit for the, um, for the organisation. But And also that, that overspend, as it states in the paper, is at 1.2% of the overall budget so whilst we are very concerned um, on where um, the fact that we have we are predicting a forecast overspend and we know what the drivers are we're assured that the organization is doing everything it can to, to deal with um, the situation um, what I also want to talk about that has been alluded to is um, the announcement from the Chancellor last week on first impressions that looks like it will be good for us but we've got to be um, very cautious, and until we see the detail, um, we can, we, we're not going to get um, carried away or start talking about what we can or can't do. But um, I think that does reflect some of the um, pressure that's been put on um, to central government through the MPs, through the likes of the LGA, and through county councils network. And when, we, when we've got a bit more clarity on the detail, I'll be writing to all of the MPs to thank them and thank um, the Treasury, Secretary of State, MHCLG for, for that help, which um, we'll be very grateful for. So, Councillor Longley, did you want to sum up in any way? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, <clears throat> just comment on um, Councillor Scrimshaw's and uh, Jim's um, initial comments on the, the, uh, the children's first is rising. Um, I think that's what I said when I started um, reporting to you, so just repeating what I said. Um, and there's no doubt that is the issue. Um, all the other um, directorates seem to be in pretty good shape. So um, clearly that's, that's the, the area where concentration is most needed. Ordinarily, this far out from the year end, I wouldn't be overly concerned about that number because there's time to do something about it. But it's the, it's the forecast that's the issue here, that the overall forecast for NCC has improved on a month-by-month -month basis. These last three months you may have observed but the children's has not. So the forecast, if the forecast was stable at that number and remained at that, then I'd be, I'd be, um, I would be relatively unconcerned. So that's the comment on that. You did speak um, about senior management posts, what's going on in the future, and also um, scouting for, for North Ants. Well, we do the budget on a year-by-year -year basis, so the answer to this, uh, what's going to happen in the future, remains to be seen, so I can't answer that question. Um, the trigger for staff um, hasn't changed. The trigger for staff is when we judge we can, um, we can deal with it properly. So that hasn't changed either. And the final point I was going to make, which I think the Chair has actually made, we've had our first sight of the central budget and um, it looks, uh, looks positive. Now, um, the devil's in the detail as always, and I think we'll know properly. It, will, it probably won't be till December, but um, so far so good. So, Chair, that's my report. Thank you. Thank you. Cabinet, do we agree the recommendations? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Item 7, monthly capital reports, forecast outturn as of period 4. Councillor Longley. <coughs> right, now the important number in this, um, um, in this report is, of course, the uh, item 1. Um, cabinet request to note the forecast capital expenditure of 88 million. That's not significantly different, hasn't been all year. And um, there's, um, um, there's very little really um, to, to, to comment on there other than it's in the, um, on, in the paper. The, the important point there is that we're maintaining the approach to capital that um, was outlined in the budget. And that is that um, it's based on productivity. We'll always do productivity if we can, obviously. 
If we sell one asset, a poor asset, and buy another one, that's okay. Or indeed, if somebody else is funding it, that's fine. So um, I'm not going to comment in detail on this because um, I think it's, it's fairly straightforward and in, um, in the usual case from the, um, the capital people, it's usually in good order. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Longley. Councillor Scott. Uh, defer to Councillor McGee. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. A um, couple of things, if I may, Chair. On page 43, item 1, the integrated transport block, um, I clearly welcome this, but can I have a breakdown of the areas where that will be spent, please? Is it duty and underspend in some areas, or is it extra work being proposed? And Chair, while I have the seat, can I talk about future capital receipts? Given that um, it was said some time ago, six months ago, I believe, that um, a school in Indo was said to be sold and it's falling into disrepair, um, can we have an update on that? And Chair, it would be good on, on future capital receipts to talk about Chester Farm and get a project board progression, an update on that, if we may. And I do believe there's a cha shape-changing board um, moving forward looking at unitaries. It may be good that we get an update, whether at full council or cabinet, of what's happening there to give us an understanding of any future capital receipts coming from that uh, and indeed the, the state of the, the organisation and the buildings that we have moving forward. Thank you. Councillor Haykel. Um, thank you, Leader. Page 43, Northamptonshire Library's self-service 372000. Can we have some assurance, given that the current contract terminates in October 2019, in a month, that the terminals will no longer be supported? Um, and, and from Councillor Bowen's point of view, my comment earlier was about all libraries, not just Rothwell. I think I sit here with all libraries. The question will be, if they are no longer supported, what impact will that have on those libraries who have put their bids in as to having equipment which is crucial and unsupported and waiting for a contract to be delivered to replace? That was in time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Haykel. Okay. Carrie, no, would you mind giving us a comment in response to the point yes, on the, the library? The, um, the um, process for um, ensuring that um, the new contracts are in place to enable the self-service terminals to continue is underway, so we don't anticipate any gaps in service there. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's the reassurance you're seeking. Okay, thank you. We'll pick up with Councillor McGee exactly which meeting you were referring to after the meeting. But um, if there is something that needs to be brought back through Cabinet that shows a bit of transparency and the way forward with it, then um, we'll, we'll make sure that happens. Councillor Longley, did you want to pick up on any other points? Uh, yeah, I thought the... Oops. Oops sorry. Councillor McGee's um, questions are fine. We'll, we'll see what we can do for you there. No, no issues with that. Councillor Baker. We, in answer to Councillor McGee's question, we will look into the school that you mentioned and send you a detailed report on what is exactly happening there. We don't have it with us today. Councillor Morris. Thank you. It was just an observation, really, that of the four capital schemes that we're talking about, three of them have been funded from Section 106. So it is always worth pointing out how good we are at getting in 106 money for developments and various other things. So the only one that's discretionary is the, is the library bit that we were talking about earlier. So it's always worth noting that the, the, uh, the strength of the 106 contribution to developments and, uh, and such like in the county. Thank you, Chair. And just as a side, my children did the uh, summer reading challenge and I was very impressed by how efficient the library and the checking in out service was through, um, through those automated machines. Very good. So it's good that we've got something in here to make sure they're covered as we move forward. So, Cabinet, are we happy to agree the report? Yes. Thank Indeed. you. So, item eight, the corporate performance report, Councillor Bowen. Okay. 
Yes, yeah, so just to remind you all, uh, this covers the period April to June 2019. Um, the set of metrics have actually been reviewed um, to include service areas and transformation areas, which weren't in there before. Um, the indicators are updated annually, um, and they will only appear in the relevant quarter, so that's just for clarification. Um, we've also introduced corporate measures, um, which were not included in the last reporting. Uh, that includes includes FOI and complaint response timescales, staff turnover and sickness levels. Um, benchmarking is for the most still for 2017 and 18 um, and will be updated as and when available. I just wanted to highlight a couple of areas. Um, one being the Healthy Child Programme, which is part of the public health funding. Um, and that notes 96.4% of new birth visits delivered in 12 weeks period. Uh, and the reason why I wanted to highlight that is because it's nearly 10% higher than the national average. Um, and the other area is the drug and alcohol treatment, which, um, again, Northamptonshire always seems to perform quite well there, um, particularly for both opiate users and non-opiate users, and for alcohol treatment. Um, Ian, did you want to say something about detox at all? Um, yes, I was just going to make a very brief comment on that, that although the trend is showing uh, an upward trend, there are some um, outliers that have sort of um, skewed those figures slightly with some of the figures from some of the hospitals. So I think overall the trend would be down, I think, on detox if we took out some of those outlying trends from some of the hospitals. So it's good news in, in real terms, but in the way it's modelled on here, it, it's slightly increased. But that was my comment on that. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Uh, yeah, I, I echo. Do you want to put your, uh, your microphone on, Councillor Scott? Sorry, Chair. Sorry, Chair. Uh, the areas I'd like to highlight. First one is the NHS health checks program, uh, where we're 15 per cent down there. Um, yeah, and this is some, one area where fitness and health for especially the elderly is something that we're supposed to be concentrating on, and yet we're going down in terms of the health checks and those invited to be have a health check. I don't think I've ever had an invitation to be a health check, and I've been in that category for the last seven and a half years. But there we go. Um, the other area is permanent exclusions from schools. I know I've mentioned this I don't know how many times, I must mention it about two or three times a year, and it's usually at the time when we see the graph that shows that uh, if we look back ten years, that graph wouldn't be all that dissimilar. You know, we don't seem to be making any headway in getting a consistent position on that. When the figures come up at the schools forum, that's the time we seem to so we give a warning to schools and, and then it improves for a bit and, but we then go back to what it was you know, surely there's something better we can do on that chair um, and the other one on the same page 71 is the uh, elective home educated children you know, which seems to have gone up greatly uh, and that, I know that's been a concern on the safeguarding board I know it's been a continued concern uh, amongst uh, the cabinet member responsible for that and the director. Um, you know, perhaps we can have a paper on that sometime because we'll come on to the safeguarding board report later on, but it's abysmally short of detail in that respect. It just mentions it, not what they're doing about it. Um, and the last one is in terms of number of complaints received. Uh, and we seem to be falling down in uh, in our timely answers to that. Um, you know, I, I do understand that a lot of the complaints get more and more complex, but we've had instances where complaints have gone on for about two years, you know, and surely that can't be acceptable. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Baker. Um, I just wanted to come back because I'm sure that Councillor Scott would know that I would be exceedingly um, agitated about this electively home educating. We have um, 
raised it everywhere I can, every meeting I go to with other bodies involved in education. Um, we also, um, the director and myself had a meeting with one of the MPs from Northamptonshire on Friday and it was a vital part of that conversation as well. Um, there are things happening uh, but we need to push them to happen quicker because that is an area that is very dangerous, I think. Uh, permanent exclusions are another area, as you know, that we would be exceedingly concerned about. One of the difficulties is that obviously at academy schools we don't have the same rights to just go in there and tell them what to do. So we are now building up a, a, a relationship. I've visited five schools in the last term and I'm planning to do five more in the next term to actually build a relationship with them so that we can have a conversation to see if they are able to do something else. I visited a school the other day where they had an exclusion area for people that they had excluded from mainstream, but they still kept them in the school. So there are some things happening. It's just too slow, I agree. Councillor Hakewell. Yes, thank you very much, Leader. Um, page 65, proportion of children placed in in-house provision. Um, one of the things that always strikes me about this particular data is the assumption that out of house has got to be more expensive. And I don't know, and perhaps the portfolio holder can tell me, if data on that actually exists. And the point that I might make is that if we were in Cornwall, out of house in three sides of the county is, is the sea. We're in Northamptonshire. Market Harbour is close, Rugby is close, Peterborough is close, Milton Keynes is close. So an out of house for someone in Toaster being in Milton Keynes is very different from someone in a different part of the county. So my question is twofold. Do we have the data of where those out of house are? And secondly, if we met our nirvana of everybody being in house that we could be, what is the fiscal saving that would be anticipated from doing that? Those are my two questions. Thank you very much, Leader. Thank you. Councillor Baker, did you want to tackle any of those or should um, we get back to Council? The Councilor? figures that you require, I think we need to go back and send you via an email later on. Um, out of house means not in local authority provision. It doesn't necessarily mean out of county. Thank you. That's, so, I will answer the rest of it because I need more data to send you. Thank you. I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, I think there's some interesting data and interesting challenges um, articulated um, in, the, in the report. Um, there's some good performance in terms of the employability and employment rates in Northamptonshire. Also how the number of apprenticeships um, are rising as well. But I just want to echo the point Councillor Baker made on the concerns around electrically home educated, educated children. That's something we have talked about and we, we agreed that we'd be right into the LGA to say there's a direct link with this and one of on that last uh, serious case review so there's something needs to be done we think at a national level so we'll be acting on that and trying to raise that as a as an issue that needs tackling at a at a high national central government level mm -hmm. but council bowen did you want to <coughs> um, finish up yeah first of all on the number of complaints um, received and delivered in time scale. Um, we've actually had a 43% increase in, in complaints with one means or another over the last two years. Um, the, the amount delivered in time scale has, has reduced by 3.2%. So as you can imagine, there's been a massive increase, but delivery has still managed to be consistent. Having said that, uh, we should be aiming to do better, and I know that there is a plan for that. Um, second of all, I just wanted to comment on the NHS health checks, the 15% down in... Um, uh, take up. Uh, that is actually GP instigated. We report on those stats. Very difficult for us to have any control over um, but I guess uh, going forward we need to, to keep an eye on that to, to see what we can do to do to take that, that further uh, up in terms of usage. And that's it. Thank you. But oh, I was just going to say, it's, it's good that we've had so many comments because that means that everybody's reading it and the information is actually being utilised and there is something to go forward. So I appreciate the comments. Cabinet, are we happy to note the report? Thank you. So item nine, 
the consultation on the future of the Evelyn Wright Care Home. Councillor Morris. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, the Cabinet's asked to approve the commencement of a consultation process on the pro proposals which are set out in this report. Uh, note that a further report will be presented to Cabinet containing the results of the above consultation in order to make a final decision on the future of the service. So I'm pleased asking you to note the contents of the report and note the contents of the equality impact assessment. Uh, by way of a bit of background, this is a 29-bedded uh, registered residential care home for people over, for older people over 60 who have a physical and or uh, dementia disability. Um, it's in need of significant capital investment to bring it up to modern standards and to make it fit for future use. Um, some of the rooms are already out of use and uh, it's, had a, it's had a required improvement uh, rating by CQC following their June 2019 inspection. So effectively we're going to have a, a consultation on the possible options for the building. Uh, it's reached its end of life condition. It's likely to need substantial capital investment of about £800,000 in order to carry out the immediate remedial works identified, as well as further additional amounts for necessary modernisation work. So we will obviously be uh, increasing support uh, for the people who uh, currently reside there and uh, once we've had the consultation we'll have a look at bring it back probably to cabinet later next uh, next year after the 10 weeks uh, it'll probably come 14th of January to next year so the options that have been unviable so far are to do nothing and continue to use the site in its current state because it's not feasible as the site will soon become unfit for purpose uh, or to invest funds of approximately 800,000 to improve the site to bring it up to modern standards and make appropriate interim arrangements for customers while necessary works are undertaken. The level of disruption this would cause current residents would be unacceptable. So we will have the feedback from that consultation uh, in January or before January and we'll bring it back to the Cabinet then when we make further decisions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Morris. Councillor Scott. Uh, do further Councillor Stone. very much. Um, I'm a bit concerned that we've allowed an NCC uh, property to deteriorate to the extent uh, that it has, or from the sound of the report that it has. And I'm wondering, um, if it was decided to keep the facility open after a review in 2016, was that done in the knowledge that it would be allowed to deteriorate and then be closed? Or was the thinking then that it would be properly maintained? Um, I'm also, I would also like more information about the residents. So we know most of the residents are women. There's no indication in the report about any ethnicity or any other um, kind of demographic where we would need to pay particular attention, for example, to culturally driven needs. So I'd like more information about that. Um, I'd also be quite interested to know how long the residents have been there and when the last referral into that facility was made. And I'd like to know that because we know that any move for people with those vulnerabilities is always going to be very unsettling and very stressful, both for them and for their families. So we need to know what the scale of that is going to be. In the um, proposal, is asking people if they want to continue with in-house provision. It's not clear to me in that wording whether that means in that facility or whether there is an option to have in-house facilities somewhere else. And I think we've got cross-party agreement in this authority that we favour in-house and don't favour outsourcing. So I'd be really interested to know if people want in-house provision, how that's going to be found. And I'd just like to say something about the Equalities Impact Assessment. The point is made over and over and over again that we need more information and more robustness in terms of equality impact assessment. And we need to know 
what the issues are and what the mitigations are. So if we know that this proposal is going to impact on people's well-being, which it will do, then we need to know what the mitigations are. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Morris, would you like to pick up on some of those? If you yes, can? Um, I think that was quite a detailed list of questions. So if, if it's OK with Councillor Stone, we will, we will take those offline and answer those separately. But I would think it would be very unlikely that we would um, assess any property and say that we weren't going to, we were going to allow it to fall into disrepair. We would always try and maintain it to a, as good a level as we could, particularly as we've got customers in, the, in that property. I don't think it would be right to suggest that we would do otherwise. And it is only, it is a consultation, so uh, we, will, we will come back to it when we have a more in-depth view of what people's ideas as to what we may or may not do might be because no, nothing's ruled out or in really particularly at this point until until we know what people would like to see happen with it the equality impacts assessment well i think all the information's in the report but i, I do take uh, i will have a look at that for you as part of those questions um but as far as i'm concerned i think that was done correctly and has followed the due procedure that it needs to for for this report and and for any other report that we have so thank you chair Thank you. Yeah, to remind everybody, this is about um, the commencement of the consultation. Mm -hmm. So, Cabinet, are we happy to approve the recommendations and particularly note the content of the equality impact assessment? Yeah. Thank you. So, item 10, Northamptonshire Sport Incorporation. Councillor Morris. Thank you, Chair. Um, Northampton Sport is a, is a, is a very, very a very good organisation for this county. Um, it's, it's done an awful lot to reach out and, and bring sport to, to the people of Northamptonshire. Uh, essentially what this paper is proposing is w we host N Sport. Um, as we move towards uh, two unitaries, N Sport would like to become uh, their own operation, as it were, to so set up a trust uh, uh, to operate from within so that they can continue to operate across the two unitaries as and when they are delivered in 2021. But um, it, it's no suggestion of any sort of um, trying to uh, remove themselves from Northamptonshire County Council. It's just for operationally going forward, it makes a lot of sense for them to have a wider reach across, uh, well, areas other than Northamptonshire, presumably, but also across the two new unitaries. So I would recommend this paper to the Cabinet. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Uh, to Councillor McKay. Thank you. Don't mind at this, but I absolutely agree with Councillor Morris on this one. <laughs> so I, I only step forward to, to praise the work of NSPORT. They're a fantastic organisation and we know that they, they go a long way to help prevent um, obesity in our children with all the sports that they do and the work that they do in schools. And indeed, they have the sports awards every year highlighting to people what they achieve. I think six of the seven boroughs actually get involved in the sports awards as well as a county-wide one. So, Chair, what I would ask one question and make a plea for years that are involved moving forward in unitaries, please continue to support and fund this organisation. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Councillor Haykwell. Thank you very much, Leader. Um, page 10, 8.1.5, which says do nothing, um, always an amusing title to a paragraph, um, simply goes through and talks about the route map for any transitioning into new unitary authorities in clear. Um, I think we probably all agree with that, but this service, uh, as I understand it from that, means it has to be county-wide anyway. But uh, it's interesting to note the lack of clarity going towards unitary. 9.7, page 11, should viability issues ensure with the CIO following corporation, no liabilities will fall on NCC. So in that circumstance, whilst we are hosting, would we pick up any particular problem of funding within NSPORT and thus when we are not hosting is there a risk if that doesn't work without our backup without our hosting ability that it could fail completely thank you 
Thank you. I just wanted to add a couple of points because in one of my previous roles, I had the honour of being the chair of the County Sport Partnership. Notice the director, Chris Holmes, there, and welcome to our meeting, Chris. Um, I understand the reason for this um, decision uh, is endorsed by uh, Councillor McGee. Uh, NSport is a excellent organisation. Um, you only have to go to the sports awards to um, see the, the breadth and depth of the reach the um, that NSport has, as well as all the work it does in schools, and I saw some of that in some of the schools. It's a really, really good organisation that frankly hasn't had the profile i don't think that it's um that it should um that it really deserves but um i understand the reason for the decision before us today and um i'm sure we're going to endorse that and agree with that but wish the organization all the best in the future and hopefully those of us who may or may not be involved in um, the unitaries in the future will continue to support um your end sport as well so cabinet uh, council morris sorry no, I think you've summed it up very well, but it, it, it does also allow them to look at other funding opportunities if they, they can stand alone as well, uh, and I think that's very important for their, for their future going forward. I think, I agree with you, we would always endorse and support them and hope that the new unitaries will do the same, but I'm absolutely sure that they will, because the work that they do is so key to and vital to the health and well-being of many of our children and, and other people in the county that I think it would be a poorer place without them being here. So I would like to think they would endorse it. Thank you, Chair. Cabinet, we happy to agree the report? Thank you. So item 11, the RIPA Reaper update. Yeah. Councillor Bowen. <coughs> okay, so... Um this is uh, for approval for the amendment of this particular policy. Um, the Regulation of uh, Investigatory Powers Act 2000, RIPA, and the Investigatory Powers Act 2016, IPA, provide for and regulate the use of a range of investigative powers by a, a variety of public authorities. So RIPA and IPA are consistent with the Human Rights Act 1998 and create a system of safeguards reflecting the requirements of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, ECHR, which I know some of our other people in the room will be very interested to know the background on. And that states that any interference by a public authority with the right to respect for a person's private and family life his home or his correspondence are carried out in accordance with the law. In carrying out the functions, officers of the council may need to use methods covered by RIPA and IPA, where it is necessary and proportionate to do so. If the correct procedures are not followed, evidence may be disallowed by the courts. Uh, a complaint of maladministration could be made to the Investigatory Powers Tribunal and or the Council, and the Council could be ordered to pay compensation. Local authorities are subject to the oversight provisions by the Investigatory Powers Commissioner, that's the IPC, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, the IPT, um, which was created to investigate complaints about covert conduct by various public bodies. Local authorities should keep their activities which fall under this legislation under review, as well as report to Cabinet on the use of, if any, of these powers. <coughs> so um, there have been no use of these powers by officers in the past 12 months, you'll be pleased to hear. Uh, and I put forward, on behalf of the Cabinet, re the revised policy for approval, um, and to ask that delegated authority be given for the monitoring officer and in consultation with the Head of Trading Standards to amend any further guidance related to this policy. It's quite a mouthful, but I think I got through it. Well done. Councillor Scott. Thank you, Chair. Defer to Councillor Strachan. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, while we welcome this report, I have to say it appears this document was put together with some haste, perhaps to meet a specific deadline. Example on page 21, subheading background, the bottom of 
paragraph one refers to his home or his correspondence rather than his or her in both cases. Mm. <coughs> and while I agree with the statement in paragraph one and two, how could members be satisfied this happens? Could we be told who monitors this and how is it monitored, please? On uh, the top of page 22, policy states, and I quote, Northamptonshire County Council is committed to the principles of equality and social justice in both employment and delivery of services. Yet, Chairman, I have not seen any color in either the Cabinet or Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Considering we live in, an, in a diverse, con <coughs> diverse county, where does this sit, equality sits? 3F, same page. Who inspects our surveillance equipment? Also, how and when and at what intervals? Finally, in H, page 23, I quote, the policy is reviewed on an annual basis by elected members. Question, could you provide the date when this was last carried out and the names of the councillors involved, please? Thank you, bye-bye. Sorry. Thank you. Councillor Bone, did you want to respond to those? Mm -hmm. I won't respond to them all because um, the last, which I'll deal with first, the last review date uh, before my time, so I can't answer that, but I'm sure um, our monitoring officer will come back to you on that particular date. Um, in terms of uh, colour, race, etc., you said about the lack of representation in Cabinet. Um, we, our Chief Whip is actually uh, Suresh Patel, um, so I think we do have a cross-section in our group. And um, in terms of um, how this policy is monitored, well, it's, it's monitored by the monitoring officer in consultation with the Head of Trading Standards. And um, some training has been given recently, and we can offer that training again um, should those in the audience wish to take that training up. It's quite heavy and in-depth, but if you are interested, we can provide that for you. Um, and in terms of the monitoring of the surveillance equipment, that will be done by Trading Standards. Thank you. Okay, Cabinet, are we happy to agree the approval of the amended policy as per the recommendation? Thank you. So item 12, the SEND sufficiency plan and proposals for spend of DfE capital funds for SEND following a consultation. Councillor Baker. Thank you, Chairman. We are just at the end of the consultation on this matter. We contacted 800 parents with children that require or use these provisions, and we have had 235 in-depth responses. We were asking parents to inform us about the type of provision that they would like to see for their children. Following the completion of, a con of the consultation, we held concerning the sufficiency of special schools and designated units, we are now looking at starting to implement some of those actions. We have also contacted schools across the county to ask for expressions of interest in having a unit provision on their site so that children with EHC care plans can be, at times, integrated into the mainstream systems. The consultation has shown that, where possible, children should be in the mainstream system, so this would give them the best of both worlds, to have special education in their own unit, but on the site of a mainstream school, so that they can partake in some of the activities in the mainstream system. We have a number of expressions of interest for this, but we will be following up on more um, as time goes by. We have well, had one from schools East North Hants and a high functioning autism and mental health provision for academically able students and we would look to increase this provision. We also have proposals for a provision on the mainstream site at Huxlow in Earthingborough. 
The special schools team will be actively liaising with all schools in the county to see where more of these provisions can be found. We're also looking at finding a site for a new special school in South North Hants, which I know that we are all uh, working on very hard at the moment because this is a very much needed resource. Over the past year, we have had an increase of 130% in assessments and resulting in 20% increase in EHC plans. This is all compounded by the increase in numbers required for school places and for all young people across the county. All of these proposals will be funded, you will be pleased to hear, by the DSG settlement for Northamptonshire. I'm asking Cabinet to note the findings of the report endorse the proposal for a new special school in South Northamptonshire, take account of the number of places required and the preferred options for delivery of these places as borne out by our consultation. I'm also asking Cabinet to approve delegated authority <coughs> to the Director of Children's Services and the Lead Member for Children to develop the schemes up to the value of £500,000 for each provision. A second report will be submitted to Cabinet once individual schemes have been identified and agreed, and also there will be a separate report on the special school for South North Hants when that time is right. I ask Cabinet to agree this report. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Councillor Scott, did you, did you indicate? No, okay, thank you. I just want to endorse um, the points. Um, Capturing the recommendations, particularly the one about South or Thance, we need to make sure we have provision there for the obvious reasons and costs associated with transporting children around the county and welcome the um, report before us today. Cabinet, are we happy to agree with the report? Yes. Thank you. Item 13, Adult Social Care Fair Contribution Policy, Councillor Morris. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just start with the recommendations, uh, and I make no apology for reading them out. The first one is to approve the commencement of a consultation process. Note the content of this report. Note the content of the EQIA, which is the Equality in Assessment Impact, Impact Assessment. Note that the ASC Fair Contributions Policy incorporating the agreed, agreed changes following consultation will be presented to Cabinet for approval in February 2020. So just some more detail behind that. There will be a 12-week consultation to allow all stakeholders to consider the proposed changes to the Adult Social Care Fair Contributions Policy, which is something we've been doing from time to time anyway, to bring it in line with other uh, authorities that surround us and are of similar sizes etc and all the changes within this report reflect that. Um, we also will be organising a number of community events, consultation events. There were a number booked but I, I'm not sure of the dates at this point but they will be going to Corby, Toaster and Northampton. Uh, we'll make sure all councillors know when, when they are happening. Um, in, in short though this is what we're doing. We're trying to bring uh, the rates for various things which I'll go into in a minute, uh, up to the standards and the, and the, co the size of uh, budget for similar areas. So the three areas are the residential colleges. Um, the proposal is to, ch to charge people under domiciliary rules rather than residential rules. This means that they can keep more of their income to spend on activities which will increase their quality of life. Uh, the customer contribution will be significantly reduced for this service. Last year we only looked after 10 younger adults between 18 to 24 who had access to a residential college, so it's not a massive cohort, but we are hoping that this change will encourage more younger adults to access this service, uh, and in fact that would actually lead to a loss of income to us of £10,000, so it's a positive move to help encourage uh, adults between the age of 18 and 24 to access residential colleges. The second area would be for the single rate of standard disability related expenditure. DRE is an additional income disregard offered to qualifying customers. Um, it's, it's quite a complex area, so I won't go into a huge amount of detail, but again, it is to equalise it with areas that surround us. And I again stress that this is a consultation, so no, there have been no decisions, but it is to look at how we might standardise those rates. Um, to, 
put it in perspective, there are 885 customers who, who would actually have to pay less towards their care under this ch proposed change for which we are obviously going to consultation. Uh, and, uh, and there may be, uh, in the region of 2,000, you may have to pay a, a little bit more, uh, although not a huge amount more. Uh, you can still get a personalised assessment, which still be an option for those affected, which would also affect the figures. Uh, and then the, the other areas for the older person standard income disregard, which is quite a technical subject, but it's uh, we currently offer older people a disregard of £194.50 per week. The minimum amount for older people is 889 per week if you were to equalise it up. So we're having a look at that. Uh, again, nothing has been decided. It's a consultation. So uh, please, everyone, feel free to feed into that consultation or indeed come and see me if you want further information on any of it. But to put it in perspective, there are 2,124 older people who may have to contribute towards the cost of their care as a result of this proposed change, which, as I say, hasn't been agreed. It is all subject to this consultation. And just to put it, uh, just to give you the uh, the areas we've looked at around us, we've looked at Peterborough, Cambridgeshire, Milton Keynes, Warwickshire, Leicestershire, Oxfordshire, Bedfordshire and Buckinghamshire, and they're all at those lower rates if, if they were to be applied once we have obviously consulted on it. Uh, Chair, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. It's quite a complex area, but as I say, I'm very happy to discuss it with anyone that has any specific questions on the paper. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Morris. Councillor Scott? Uh, Defer to Councillor Stone. Thank you. Could you put the microphone on, please, Daniel? Really, really much needed provision. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the other proposals, though, and I'm wondering why none of this has come to scrutiny. I thought we'd reached an agreement that scrutiny was the place where these proposals should come first so that we have the benefits of, of their view when, we're, when you're making decisions. Um, I'm also a bit concerned about the way things happen. So if the policy was changed as recently as April 2018, why wasn't this considered then and why is it okay um, to keep having changes in policy? And I'm saying that because we're talking about, again, very vulnerable people and very vulnerable families, and it just adds to their stress levels, doesn't it, if we keep making uh, changes. The proposals are going to make 2,399 people poorer. I don't, and it's by such a small amount, significant for them, not significant for us. And I just wonder why we would do that, really. It doesn't seem the right thing to do. It would look to the outside world as if we are making the poorest pay for our budget deficit, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, the other, kind, the other um, question I've got is really a reassurance I'm looking for, really, that this won't be taking away the service's ability to be flexible in the way that it responds to individual need, because um, I think that's fairly important. And presumably, when those assessments are made, there'll be an appeals process, will there? Um, and again... In the Equalities Impact Assessment, it says that the exact profile of users has been established. How tantalising is that? I want to know what it is. <laughs> be really good to know what it is. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Haykel. Yes, it, it perhaps picks up a little bit on that. Um, reading through the report and understanding the motivation, and inevitably it's the start of a consultation, so that will end. The motivation, obviously, is, is a, as far as I can see, a revenue input to the council of £769,000. Um, just really trying to understand 
some of the associated county data that Councillor Morris pointed out. I don't know if it did go to scrutiny. I think I'm absented from scrutiny, but it would be really useful with all those counties around to allow a decision to be made to sort of do some comparators. So could we have the data that uh, Councillor Morris obviously has got access to, but we haven't, just out to us during the process of this consultation so that when we do meet people, we can actually say, well, this is in line with Milton Keynes or Peterborough or Cambridgeshire or whatever else, because I'm sure that would help us in the same way as it seems to have helped the portfolio holder to come to this conclusion. Is it? Lots of nodding, so I think my answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Morris, did you want to respond on some of those points? Yes. Um, essentially, it is a consultation, so it won't have come to scrutiny. It's a proposal for next year anyway, isn't it? So it will come to scrutiny in the normal process of uh, setting the budgets and things like that next year. But obviously we need to uh, set up, we need to consult with the public and with the, the end users and people like that for, for what we are proposing. Um, so it will come to scrutiny. I'm absolutely sure of that. Well, we'll make sure it does, but it will come in due course once we've had the consultation once we react to the consultation once the papers come back here uh, next year and then we'll, we will go from there so um, in terms of um, what, what councillor stone said yes the residential colleges bit is is really actually very good news and I, I did want to highlight that so i will highlight it again sometimes proposals of change or proposed changes are not always for revenue saving. In fact, this one is definitely not for revenue saving. This is to encourage people to take up the service because it's had uh, not much of a pickup. In terms of the, the, the other points that are made, we always have to look at where we can best spend our money and what's best value for money. And uh, if, to my mind, looking at people that uh, surround us, other counties and other districts and other places that do the same thing, you have to look <coughs> at what they are they are doing in order to, I think, baseline your value for money because in some way, not that anyone would ever say that spending more is a bad thing, but we have to prioritise our budgets uh, across every directorate, but particularly keenly in, in, in the adults and social care directorate. Um, I think if there are any other questions, and I know Councillor Stone had quite a few, we will pick those up uh, offline as well and come back to you with fuller answers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Morris. Cabinet, we agree. Do we agree the recommendations include in the Equalities Impact Assessment? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So move on to item 14, introducing a council advertising and sponsorship policy. Councillor Smithers is picking this one up. Uh, thank you, Councillor Gobby. Um, this is uh, so that the council can formulate a advertising and uh, sponsorship policy. There are many benefits to the council when they enter into a sponsorship and advertising opportunities. They provide the opportunity to raise the profile of the services we provide, engage better with the communities we serve, support local businesses to uh, grow their operations, build relationships and reduce or enhance the cost of service provision for the council. There is a need to ensure the council maximises opportunities and income and secures a best value for money, but there is also a need for policy to clearly set out what is acceptable in terms of advertising and sponsorship uh, content, ensure there is uh, no conflict with the council's priorities, values or services, and clearly sets out how the council will approach this. Introducing, uh, sorry, introducing a corporate policy on advertising sponsorship will enable the council to uphold the council's reputation and corporate identity, secure best value for money and maximise income, provide a framework and control measures, establish a corporate approach and standards, ensure compliance with legislation, advertising industry codes and other council policies, support development of commercial partnerships within the private sector, and safeguard the image and environment of Northamptonshire. The policy will apply to all paid for advertising and sponsorships on all channels, both external and internal, in all services across the council. It will set out the definitions of advertising and sponsorship and the terms upon which advertising and sponsorship opportunities will be sought and accepted. Uh, will be published via the council's intranets and public facing websites. The purpose of the policy is to provide guidance to officers and members on advertising and sponsorship activities for the council which are deemed acceptable, provide clarity to the potential clients regarding the forms of advertising and sponsorships that will be accepted, 
and the terms under which such business will be undertaken. The policy states that the Council will refuse applications from companies who are in dispute with the Council or where there is a potential stroke active legal action. Will also not accept advertising or sponsorship from companies who are in contract negotiations with the Council where this may be viewed as an endorsement of this bid. Will uphold publicity code on recommended practice on local authority publicity. So if Cabinet can approve the advertising and sponsorship policy as per the report. Councillor Scott. Uh, call Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, while we fully support the contents of the paper, we are somewhat confused as to whether this, the administration is claiming the policy did not exist. Are we, are we claiming this is something new or is this an updated version? Chairman, for years we have had ad advertising boards on our highways as well as sponsorship boards on our roundabouts. We even had debates about this at full council in terms of charges, etc. Are we saying this, that, that no policy existed to protect the council, its officers and councillors? With all the cuts to services this council have had to carry out, why in heaven's name we have employed consultants to rewrite this policy? Could we be told how much resource it costs the council for this paper, please? Um, we just heard from uh, Councillor Morris, and he was talking about spending money wisely and getting value for money. Well, quite frankly, Chairman, this don't make any sense at all, because we have already had a policy. Thank you. Councillor Haycourt? Um, yes. Al always a very risky thing for a local authority because uh, we are seen as the uh, purveyors of, of the best standards in that way. Um, given the report, do we have any idea what the remuneration of the successful implementation of this policy may be? Have we got any idea of what this might generate for the council? And I think the other thing is, all of us feel, and I think in the policy it makes sense, irritated by going into um, particular organisations outside of the council where you are flashed up with adverts and so on. You basically want to do something, find out where a bus runs or whatever. So I really hope that it won't add to the delays of our customers getting to what they want to learn without having to go through. But <coughs> is there any sort of business plan which says in year one, two or three, we hope this will generate this amount of income? So this is a policy, isn't it? Thank you. So, Councillor Smithers, I'm not sure if you're able to answer all of those yet. And my comment, so the, just that last point, is this is a policy, not a business plan, isn't it? So it's about how we look to try and operate. But Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Councillor Hakewell, it, it's not about monetary value in this. It's more about just tying up loose ends, really, and having a policy, a robust policy in place, which will allow the county council to, you know, advertise or have uh, advertisers come in and, and, and work to a sort of a, you know, a policy and a framework, uh, best sort of best practice, really. Um, Councillor Strachan, again, this is a new policy um, about tying up loose ends. Um, and I would have to come back to you on the fact if uh, you know there is an existing policy, but um, I can do that via email as, uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you. Okay, Chief Exec informs me there was no consultant employed to write this either. So on that point, Cabinet, are we happy to agree the report? Thank you. So last item, item 15, the Northamptonshire Safeguarding Children's Board and your reports. Uh, Mrs Lineker, if you'd like to come up to the front. Good 
very glad to see this report. So you've got three minutes, Jean. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's all right. I'll, I'll be as quick as I can. At the last Cabinet meeting, I told you I hadn't heard from the Commissioner. I have now heard from him. So I'd like that recorded, um, <laughs> if that's all right. Um, I like, I, I'm glad to see... Um, no, oh, that's the page now. Where is it? Oh, here we go. Sorry about that. On the, um, the report, you've got something on there to do with parental um, togetherness. And I'm glad to see that because I have had a couple of cases come to me and I can't deal with them. Not really. But I'm trying to deal with one of them. I, I, I always know there's two sides to a story with parents. I know that. But the safeguarding bit, I, I'm really glad to see this report. There's quite a few bits in there. And I'd like to know if you have a policy to do with safeguarding other than the 2004 Act for Children for Safeguarding. I think the 2004 Act should be amended so that the, um, there's more and more children coming within care. And I'm glad to see this report on the table. But it should have gone to scrutiny as well for scrutinise, for anybody to scrutinise it. Okay, I just noticed on there it hadn't been to scrutiny. Had I got the papers in time, which I didn't get, because I, di I didn't get them till Saturday morning, and I've only just gone through the papers on Sunday. So I wish, hopefully, in future, I could have the papers beforehand. Okay, that's... I'm glad to see the report. Thank you, Jean. Councillor Baker, are you okay to introduce the report and cover off any other points raised by Mrs Lineker? Can I just cover off the points raised by Mrs Lineker first of all before I forget them? Um, Sorry. This report would not have gone to scrutiny because it is a partnership report. It is not the County Council's report. It okay. is the scrutiny board, which is an independent body, which it needs to be in order to look at everything we're doing. So it wouldn't oh, be for appropriate for it to go there. And we always do work, walk, work within the law. So please do be assured that the law as it stands at the moment, we do work within that law. Thank you. I'd like to present to Cabinet the annual and final report of the Northamptonshire Children's Safeguarding Board. This report was Keith Makin's last report before leaving his role as the Independent Chair of Safeguarding Children's Board in July 2019. The board transitioned then to the new safeguarding partnership arrangements in June 2019, and these were implemented in early September. A previous safeguarding board priority had been to increase uptake of early help interventions for vulnerable families, reducing the requirement for statutory children's services assessments. This will be taken forward in the new safeguarding partnership arrangements through an early help subgroup. Another key priority of the new safeguarding partnership arrangements is partnership work with children at risk of exploitation, whether this is criminal or sexual. The third priority for the new safeguarding partnership arrangements is to work efficiently as a partnership and to support staff, and this will be one of their key focuses. There has been a significant rise in gang-related activities. The CCG has led training for agencies on this, and the Police Community Initiative Reducing Crime Team are intervening directly with identified vulnerable children, and this will be, remain as a priority action for this area. Use of data has evidenced a growth in the numbers of children who are electively home educated, which is something we've already spoken about this afternoon, and the additional vulnerabilities of this group has been identified, and we will all be focusing on that in the coming months. The NSCB 
has provided an e-learning platform for all partners alongside the provision of some face-to-face -face training. They've also produced tea break guides on critical issues that assist all agencies in their safeguarding duties. So, for example, child sexual exploitation, elective home education, fabricated and induced illness, gangs and county lines, modern slavery, professional curiosity, amongst many, many others. And just to outline before uh, we finish that this new safeguarding partnership is made up of ourselves, the County Council, the police and the health authority and it is a partnership between the three of us working closely together to ensure and I've been reminded by my DCS that also head teachers are involved in this safeguarding partnership as well so um, I think that we have made the right decisions in changing in the way that we have but it is an independent body so as I said earlier this wouldn't go to scrutiny uh, but I submit the final report to the cabinet thank you councillor Scott um, thank you chair and, and since I've been so nice to you a lot today I, I may not be so nice now I, I, I jest. Chair, um, I've read this report and what I expect as I had for many years when we had the report from health and, and eventually got that changed is, is outcomes. There are some good things that says in here and what they've actually done but if you read that paper it looks like a talking shop and that's not what we want and it's good that it's changing and perhaps these changes will stop that because what I want to see for a report from this and perhaps the chair at full council will highlight some of the outcomes. What outcomes has actually been achieved to safeguard our children? Changing policies actually helped young people and made them safer. And perhaps if we get some of that information coming through in an annual report, we can have more respect for it. But it has to change the format that it's got now, because it does look like a, a talking shop. Thank you. Did you want to come back on um, those points? I think one, uh, Councillor McGee's point is very valid, and that is one of the reasons why the system is being changed to make it actually much more proactive and positive than it has been in the past. And as you put, rightly pointed out, uh, I was saving this for my last line, that this report will, of course, come to full council and it will be report, reported on by the head of this, uh, this board. Partnership. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Cabinet, are we happy to agree the report before us? Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to the end of today's meeting. Thank you.